might as well get started here. I think all the folks that are getting coffee have made it at this point. So um, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Lenche. I'm the local track chair for the um, government nonprofit and education track here at Triple Time. So um, this is one of our featured talks. I'm really excited to have Tori Porter from the U.S. Department of Agriculture on the Start to Farm program. And um, I'm a boring talker, so I'm going to let Tori do the interesting stuff. So welcome. Thank you very much. Um, when I found out I was going to speak at DrupalCon, I was really, really excited. I was like, oh, wow, this is so neat. This is a new opportunity. And then I kind of had this delayed reaction of, oh, my gosh, I'm going to speak at DrupalCon. What on earth am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to talk about Start to Farm, which I'd love to talk about. But normally I talk to farmers and farm educators about it. So this is a totally different audience. Um, so I hope that what I put together here will be of value to you. Um, I thought what I should start with is uh, introducing myself and more specifically what I do. So you see where I'm coming from um, as I describe this project. So I am a librarian. And of course, we all have you know, very specific ideas about librarians and what they do. Um, usually I get one of two reactions. Either I say I'm a librarian and they, their eyes glaze over and they just go find something else to do. Or I'll get really excited and start telling me about all their wonderful times in a library. So I talked to this one gentleman, and I explained I was a librarian, and he said, Oh, oh, I mean, he just lit up. He says, One of my first jobs, my friends and I at lunch would get in these debates over like uh, trivia, like movies and historical events and all these things. And um, they would bet each other over who got it right, you know, who said what actor was right or whatever it was. And the way they would settle their bet was they called the library down the street. And he's like, she knew everything. He says, we, she always answered our questions. She always did it perfectly. He goes, you guys just know everything. And the truth is, is we don't know everything. But, and this is the important part, we do know where everything is. So that's the trick. We also know who put it there. We know why it's there. We know what format it's in. We know who's looking for it. Uh, we know why they're looking for it and how frustrated they are trying to get to it. And we know what format they want it in. Um, so we do have a lot of information to contribute to um, information. My particular background, I work in data management and knowledge management, um, generally by accident, but I quite love it. Um, so trying to gather information in from the far corners of the universe. I also am a public service librarian, so I have spent many long hours on the reference desk asking, answering questions from people like the guy who, you know, would call up his librarian at lunch. Um, and I also work in information literacy, so teaching people how to find information, also very importantly, how to evaluate the information they find to test its um, authoritativeness or its reliability, all these things. So the program I'm going to talk to you about today um, is really, to me, very much a library function. It is all about gathering information in, making sure it's organized, and very importantly, this is where the public information comes in, making sure it's available to the people who need it. And I think that's really the crux of the whole thing, is you've got to get it to the people who need it. So Start to Farm, and this is our gorgeous logo. Um, it is part of a larger program within the USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture, called the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program, which we call BFRDP. So if I say that, I always try to be very careful about the alphabet soup. Since I work for the government, I want to make sure I don't lose anybody. Um, but the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program uh, was set up by Congress, actually, and administered through the USDA to help create more farmers. Um, and when I did this first presentation for my coworkers, I kind of just said, oh, well, we need more farmers and moved on. They said, no, you have to explain. Uh, so I will. So here's the situation. Farmers are getting older, and I hope it's no problem. Everyone is. Um, farmers are getting older, but no younger new farmers are replacing them. So we're actually losing our farmers. So why do we need new farmers? Well, there's lots and lots of reasons for that, but I'll talk about three really quickly. Um, one is economic, so farms are businesses, they can 
contribute to the economy, both locally, nationally, and internationally. So uh, keeping these uh, businesses in business is, is good for the economy. There's also a security issue. So if food, so let's take, for example, fresh produce. Um, most of our fresh produce is either flown in from overseas or it's just produced in very specific regions of the country. If there is a social or a natural disaster in these areas, we're cut off from our food supply. And this drives the cost of food up, it, it drives availability down, and this especially affects people um, who have, are on fixed income. And as you know, our society, we're, and we're seeing this starting to slip down the economic scale, you know, this becomes a bigger and bigger problem. We need food avail available, that's food security. And the last one I'm going to talk about, again, there's many, many more, uh, is social. So in the last few years, a lot of people have been very interested in where their food comes from. Um, you know, it's a big thing right now, and it's very exciting. It's um, what they find with the introduction of farmers markets and people actually being able to go out and meet farmers is that they're eating healthier. So they also um, are going out to these places and being more active. So there's a lot of benefits socially um, to having more farmers. And um, so those are the ones I'm going to cover here. I think I could spend a whole session just talking about why we need new farmers. But Congress agrees with me that we do need new farmers, um, so they set up this. And before I move on to the next slide, I actually want to talk a little bit about our program again. Is we have a partner, which is the American Farm Bureau Federation, so that's part of our, our grant requirement. But we have an unofficial partner, um, and they're all here in the front row. So this is our web developers who designed and developed the site. Uh, Swishy Media, who are local kids, so I wanted to point out that our unofficial partner, but definitely um, the reason this site is here and it's so great, is Swishy Media. So I'll give you guys a shout out. Okay. So, in 2002, Congress decided, yes, indeed, we need new farmers. So they added some legislation into what's called the Farm Bill, and this is actual law. Um, it says the Secretary, and since it's a uh, capital S, that means the Secretary of Agriculture, shall establish an online clearinghouse. And clearinghouse, just, you know, say database instead. Uh, clearinghouse kind of an older word, but. Um, that makes available to beginning farmers and ran or ranchers education curricula and training materials and programs, which may include online courses for direct use by beginning farmers and ranchers. So this wonderful idea of having this repository of information, curriculum, all these things to help train these farmers. And then this beautiful idea of, you know, these online courses. So, you know, in five easy lessons, you too can be a farmer. Not realistic. Um, but what this, what happens then is, of course, it goes to the secretary. Well, I should say, this was put in the law in 2002. In 2008, Congress actually gave it some money. So this actually started in 2008. Um, and they sent it to the Secretary of Agriculture, and of course, USDA's um, responsibility is to make these things happen. So, where in the USDA this um, program is taken on is an agency called NIFA. It's the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and they don't um, administer all the grants that come through USDA, but they administer quite a few of them. So that's really their function is to kind of, you know, get this. Uh, these different programs or research or whatever it is happening out in the country and making sure that this, this money goes where it needs to go. And so I'm going to describe the grant process just a little bit because I think it, it will help you understand later on what we're doing. Um, but what happens is NIFA then creates a document which is called a Request for Applications or an RFA. And in it they list everything that they want grant recipients to do. And then the grant recipient, the grant applicants send a proposal back and they send in their application saying what they will do. So they list out, if we get this money, we're going to do this, this, and this. And then it's reviewed and then certain people get picked and they get the money. And then you're kind of locked in, that's what you're going to do. Um, if you promise to do it, you need to deliver. So we have this um, law, this federal law, saying we have to have a clearinghouse. And what you don't see is there's more to this law saying that these, um, there's other programs that the USDA needs to do to make sure that people are able to develop this curriculum. And 
And so since they're together, there's kind of this assumption of how they should work together, but we'll see um, how that comes up later. Now, the National Institute, the, sorry, the National Agricultural Library, see, even I get lost in the alphabet too. The National Agricultural Library applied for a special grant. So most of the grants under this program are for training, and then there's one special one for this clearinghouse function to build this database. So the National Agricultural Library applied for it and got it. And here's what we promised to do. Um, so I am, I am an NAL, National Agricultural Library. Um, we promised to see what already existed. So beyond this grant program, what is actually out there in the country for beginning farmers and ranchers. We promised to build um, an online accessible clearinghouse, um, basically build the database online. And then that's kind of the, that clearinghouse uh, section that I just showed you that Congress did. And then these next two parts refer to the other grants. So help grant recipients communicate and provide outreach um, for the grant program itself. Also build a verification system and assist with the reporting on the grant. So we promised we'd do those. And lastly, we promised to put on a conference, but that's an asterisk because I'm not going to cover that here at all. It's its own session, its own conference. Um, it's quite, quite, a, quite a big deal. But um, I'm going to go through and show you how we did each of these things that we promised to do. But before I get there, there are certain assumptions um, that I find are very pervasive through uh, this this project that I feel like I need to define and explain. Because as we look at the different parts, I want you to understand what I mean when I refer to them. And the reason I really want to take a bit of time with them is because I don't only see these in this project, I see these in every project I work on. So I call them assumptions euphemistically. They're lies, they're outright falsehoods, they're myths. Um, but here they are, four of them. The first is the myth. Um, of universal oneness, this idea that everyone looks for information the same, they react to information resources the same, they use the same terms and mean the same thing. Uh, this is just wrong. It's not true. Um, everyone, there's a lot of talk here about multiple devices and multiple platforms. Um, there's just a million ways that we all do everything differently. Okay, the next one is the if you build it, they will come assumption. This only works in film with dead baseball players. It does not work anywhere else at all, ever. And this is my favorite one, the myth of the hardworking elves. So if you're familiar, there's a European fairy tale called the Elves and the Shoemaker. And the Shoemaker, he's such a, a good man but poor. And so at night, these elves will come and do all his work for him, and eventually he's able to become rich. Um, but the idea of the hardworking elves is really pervasive, especially when you're talking about public information, which is government and education and nonprofits, um, because they don't have any money. So the wonderful thing about elves, besides the fact that they have no constraints, you know, nothing stops them, is they don't have to be paid. So to give you an example of hardworking elves, um, in 2008, when we had a minor economic downturn, um, several corporations are looking for ways to save money, save their costs. So they went and they looked at their library function within their corporation, whatever way that was manifested. And librarians, I am one and I love them. They're not very good at explaining what they do. In fact, no one knows what they do. Um, so the corporation just said, well, get rid of this. What is this? And they threw it out. But you remember what I said about librarians, is we know where everything is. So then they realized they need somebody who knows where everything is. So they looked to the corporation, people they already had, because they don't want to spend any money, and they see IT. And they're like, oh, they have information in the title. They can handle it. That's the information elves. On the other hand, you have technology elves. Um, I was working in another organization. They wanted to build an institutional repository for research that was produced in the institution. And so we start developing a plan on how to make this happen, and there was some funds that might come up, and I saw the proposal to go after these funds. And under the list of personnel to build this repository, it listed three student assistants. That was the list of personnel. These 
student assistants, and I'm sure they would have been just, you know, eager and, and do the best they can, were not qualified to do what we needed them to do. Let's take knowledge elves. And I know that there are many people in this room in this conference who are, in fact, elves. So you're in an, you're in an organization of some kind, and they said, oh, we need a new web website. You look a little techie. You take care of it. So the elves is totally pervasive. Probably why many people here actually have their job. Okay, the last one is the idea that everything is available. Um, we live in a consumer society, so we tend to think of our information the way we think of any other product. You think, I need some information, I'm going to go to the information store, and I'm going to go to the shelf with the information I need, I'm going to put it in my basket, and we'll go home and make an information salad, and everything will be wonderful. However, the reality is sometimes the information is split into data that doesn't match each other, and it's actually hidden around the whole store and all the different shelves, and you have to go hunting for it. And you hunt for it, and you find it's not all there, and you turn around, and they're restocking the shelves with new bits of data that make your data obsolete. It's just not available. I can go on with the store analogy for a long time, um, but the fact is, is that everything isn't where you can get to it, and it's not the format you need it to be in. So, understanding these basic core assumptions, we can move on and look at what we needed to do to make this project work. So the first thing we promised to do is to find what already exists, and this is discovery. And there's two reasons we did it. One is to find content for the database. So we have this grant program, and we have to work with them, and they're going to produce materials, but we're not limited to that. So the Start to Farm database, our job is to find everything in the whole country for beginning farmers and ranchers. That's our job. And then also to design this database. So this is what we're, what's happening with this first uh, section. So what did we get out of it? We went and we looked at what was out there. And the first thing we did is we were able to set parameters for the project. So one of the first things I did when I arrived on the scene is I did a very librarian -ish. I sat down and I wrote a collection development policy. And what this is, is it says, we will collect this, we will not collect that. So basically giving a shape to what we were going to do. Um, and to give you an example, um, sorry. <laughs> to give you an example, there's lots of extra things um, with farming. So we think of like uh, community development is very wrapped up in farming, or the local food movement even is very wrapped up in farming. Uh, but they're not really about getting beginning farmers um, on the land. So we kind of closed doors and opened others and said, okay, here's where we're, what we're going to concentrate on. Um, so we're able to set the project parameters. Now we're able to classify what kind of database content we're going to have, um, design the structure of it, and to develop the initial taxonomy for it. So, there we go. Okay, so our classification. We sat down and we said, what do farmers need to be successful? Well, they need education and training. They need to know how to do things. Uh, they need financing. So the number one question we get is, how do I get money to start a farm? Um, they, you know, they need to know how to get the capital or, or whatever they need to get started. Technical services. So doing your taxes as a farmer is very different than doing your taxes um, just for your personal income at home. Um, so Many farmers really need someone to sit down with them and help them learn how to do that. And then networks. Farmers need um, support networks. They need other people who understand where they're coming from, that they can talk to, they need mentors, they need all these things. So we said these are the four classifications of what we're going to gather in. And then we created the structure. So we looked at these things and we said, you know, some of these things are activities, so a class or a loan program or an apprenticeship, that's an activity, and we're going to call those programs. And then you have things, so you have manuals and worksheets or non-tangible things like databases, and we're going to call those resources. And those are our two um, main classifications. And then all of these programs and resources are either created or distributed by organizations. So this is our basic database structure. These are our three content types uh, within Drupal. And if you had to, and they're not the only ones we use, but if you had to throw everything else out, this is just kind of the foundation um, of how this site works. And 
then we developed an initial taxonomy for it. Let's go look at it actually in Google. And so what we did is we went through, we looked at words that came up a lot. We looked at um, reference questions we get at the library. So we had several people who would contact us for many, many years asking about how they start, how they get started in the farming. So we looked back through the questions they were asking, and we came up with a taxonomy. cooperatives, um, incubators, all these things um, are topics that come up when you're talking about training beginning farmers and ranchers. Um, you know, helping them learn how to join a cooperative or set up a cooperative or having an incubator where they can go and actually start a farm with kind of a shelter around it um, so they can get their business off the ground. So we've developed this taxonomy. So this taxonomy plus the three content types I showed you this is the foundation um, of the functionality of the site. We have more extended functionality, but this is the basis of it. Can you believe it? All right. Um, so the second thing we promise to do is to build this online accessible database, and that put up a really big question, who is this for? So in content strategy, of course, the wisdom of content strategy says you need to define your audience and help those people. And you don't want to say, oh, we're going to take care of everyone. You want to narrow it down. So, okay, no problem. Beginning farmers and ranchers, that's our audience. Um, I want to point out with this picture that these people are not beginning farmers and ranchers. And there's a clever and subtle way you can tell and that is that they're clean. If they were farmers and ranchers, they would be filthy. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's a tough job, and you have to get out there, and you have to really do it. Um, it's long hours, hard work. Um, but people who, who love it will tell you that there's no other life. And they, they wear their dirt proudly. And I, I can say that I'm a gardener. I wear my dirt proudly, too. Um, but the reason I have this picture up um, because if you were going to come up and say, ask me, you know, who was farming, and you said, okay, so are the people who are going into farming, are they young people fresh out of college? I'd say yes. If you asked me if they were retirees, I would say yes. Disabled people, yes. Um, immigrants and refugees, yes. Um, if you said, okay, well, are they people who grew up on a farm? Yes. Are they people who've never stepped foot out of a city ever in their life? Yes. Um, and this is really something that is a basis of, of public information. We don't have the luxury of really narrowing our group down. If we were selling purses, no problem. We could say, this is, this is who's buying purses, and this is the people who are willing to buy them for what I'm willing to sell them for. That's my audience, no problem. Um, we have to take a full cross-section of society when we're working with public information. So farming is one of these things. Think about public health, education, all these things affect everyone. So when you're designing a site or, or trying to um, bring these things together, you have to keep this in mind. So what do we do? Um, we have to help everyone. How do we do it? Well, I can only tell you how we're attempting to do it at uh, Start to Farm. And this is starttofarm.com. This is our public-facing site. Um, I think this site is gorgeous. Does anyone else think this site is just absolutely gorgeous? So that's all sufficient. So, yes, definitely. And so when I was talking to Squishy, we were talking about the homepage. And, of course, you know, homepage real estate, that's such a, you know, big, scary topic. Um, but I said, okay, so you have Alice, and she falls down the rabbit hole, and she ends up with this room with big doors and little doors. I said, we need lots of doors, and they need to be different sizes, and um, they all need to leave the window in. So that's the idea of this homepage. And some of the little doors
doors include the navigation that's up at the top. Um, over here we have the spotlight section, which I won't go into, but that's really for policymakers. That's not necessarily there for the public, although it's, it's nice to have the big picture and the success story. It's there for policymakers to know these are successful programs and they need to be funded. But I'm going to look at the three big doors in the middle. And we found with the beginning farmers and ranchers, we can divide them into two groups. And one of the groups are people who have already started farming. So there's this unofficial definition of beginning farmer, which says 10 years or less as a principal operator. Um, it's completely unofficial, but it's kind of our framework to work on this. So we have people who are already on the land farming or in the, you know, the hydroponics, you know, warehouse or whatever they're doing. And then you have people who are really new to farming or just considering it. And we affectionately refer to these people as dreamers. Um, and for the dreamers, we wanted to give them a special way into Wonderland. So the first door here, the thinking about farming, takes them into a very short tutorial. And what this tutorial does, all it does is it asks them some fairly serious questions. Why do you want to farm? Do you have a plan? You know, have you thought about where you need to sell and what you're going to sell? And of course, who's this going to affect in your life? So it's short, it's, I hope, sweet. Um, but the idea is to get people to think before they just start going and looking for a loan program. Um, for farming, attrition is a success if it happens before people take on a loan or spend their savings. So we want them to quit before they do either of those things. Um, not everyone is meant to be a farmer. It's really a vocation more than an occupation. So we want to kind of gently lead them and see if they really want to go through the door. And then there are other programs that are listed in here that do that much better and much more in-depth. Uh, but we wanted to make sure it was available. And then our other two doors, and there is, I mean, there's the keyword system up at the top, so that's one of our little doors. But the other two doors are basically two ways of searching the site. And the first one is already farming. And what this is, is this is our classifications again, and this is also the way to browse our site. So these classifications learn how, is that education, training, then the financing, the technical assistance, and the network. So under Learn How, we have subcategories, and these are based, again, on questions we get at the library. What do we get the most things asked about? And that's how we came up with these topics. And within each topic, if you click on it, there's a short list of some of the resources in our database. And we try to make these short lists um, programs that are national in scope. Uh, we don't always have enough to fit in there yet, um, but we try to make things that are national in scope. But if you look back over on the left side, your left side, um, you can actually keep doing the browsing over here on the other side. So once you've found a successful plan, which you should always start with a plan, um, then you can go and start looking for financing. Don't get the financing first. Um, so that is one way to get into the site. Then the other one, and this is our newer bit, uh, is this section called Personalize Your Search. And so this is another door in, another way in. And what this does is it lets people build a short query of the database without knowing that's what they're actually doing. Because of course that's our goal, um, is to make them do all these wonderful heavy things without ever realizing it. So we ask them what they're looking for, and then we ask them who they are. And this is really based, again, on the questions we get at the library. So. I'll get an email very often and say, I'm a veteran and I want to start a farm. I'm looking for money to buy land. Um, so this is kind of based on that, that general query that we get. So let's say we are looking for training. you a list of the results. If you look back over at the left, we have our facets listed so they can actually continue to refine their search if they would like to. Um, but I want to go in. So if you go into 
one of these, this is what our records look like. So it's got a big, nice, pretty picture of the title. We have a description of what it is. So people have a chance to say, you know, here's what our program can do for you. And then we have the contact information on how to get to it. And that's all we do. We're not trying to teach people how to farm on a website. So, you know, that idea that Congress put up, oh, and you can have lessons on there, that's not realistic at all. You look back at our, our user base, a retiree who used to be an executive going into farming needs many completely different things than someone who is a refugee who just arrived from um, Sudan. You know, it's just a completely different experience. So trying to create um, a lesson or something that's going to just fit over everyone, it's impossible. It's not realistic. So we're going to get them to the programs that do that already. And then besides the, um, the contact information, we also have our tags. So they can keep looking. If they want to look for other things that are similar, they can just click on the tags. But I want to go back here into the sponsoring organization. So the International Rescue Committee administers a lot of um, refugee programs in this country. And if you click on the organization, it lists everything that's in our database that's available through that organization. So this one only has a couple, but some like the Farm Service Agency, which administers um, many loans um, and other financing programs to beginning farmers and ranchers, have quite a few. And if you go to, although they've done a much better job with their site um, just recently, but many times you go to a government site, it's very hard to find everything that applies to you. So what this site does is if you just say, okay, if you are going to your FSA office, here's all the programs they have to offer. It gives you a description of what they are. You can walk in there and say, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? Uh, which is much more effective to you as a, you know, someone using that service than walking in and saying, I don't know what to do. What do you have? I, so it's, it's a much better experience when they actually get to the office. So that's searching of the site. We're going to be making some um, more development, so this is definitely a site in progress. Those include we're going to be adding solar, um, hopefully in the next two weeks. Um, we also have, at, at NEL, we have this huge thesaurus, and of course you tell the librarians they get all excited about a thesaurus, uh, but it's like 80,000 terms long and bilingual. I mean, you can't, you have to love a thesaurus like that. Um, but what we did is we trimmed it down. And so we're going to be working that into the taxonomy as well. Um, and this will help improve the search function because we want to get people to programs. The other thing that we're working on to get into this site is to help people find things by where they're located. So current geolocation um, pinpoints things on a map. And if you're a restaurant chain, that's fantastic. But many of our programs are spread over huge um, areas of service. So, for instance, there's a program that is um, kind of headquartered in Colorado that's called Building Farmers in the West, but they also work in Washington State and Idaho and Utah and Wyoming, and they're adding states all the time. So if you have a pinpoint on the map in Colorado, how do the people in Utah find they can use that program? So we're, we're looking for modules and we're working on things that will help us actually kind of pencil in, you know, color in on the map where the service area actually is. Um, so we're really excited to hopefully get that all functioning because we think that's, that's the functionality that's needed here. Okay. So that is the public site, generally speaking. I could really go on and on and on about all of this. Uh, but I want to take you on the other end because I think this is, there's another less popular. Not, not quite so happy. Part of what we promised to do has to do with the grant recipients themselves. And so we promise to help them communicate with each other. We also promise to provide outreach to the, um, for the grant itself, the whole program. And I'm not going to go into outreach, but I will say that this is one of the hardest things there is to do. We, um, again, this is the universal oneness assumption. Everyone isn't looking in the same place for information, so you can't broadcast it and expect it to get everywhere. 
and there is a digital divide. Um, don't let anyone fool you. There definitely is. And for people who are on the other side of that digital divide, getting information to them is, is so fragmented. It's bad enough on the digital side, but it's really exceptionally bad for people who don't have access to the Internet. That's all I'm going to say about it. It's worth doing, um, but it's hard. The other thing we promised to do was build a verification system, which I'll explain what that is, and a system for reporting on the grant. So to do this, we built a separate site, and we call it the Extranet. Um, and this is a separate site from startyourfarm.gov. This is our back end. And the primary function of the back end is data entry, so to get things into the database. And over here on the left-hand side, short menu, and this top menu here is when grant recipients actually log in here, that's all they can see. That's, I mean, it's not all they can see, but it's all they have access to. The first six options here are all about data entry. And you see, like, the second one that says search here first, I named them that because it's a reminder. Don't put something in the database that's already there. Does it work? No. No, it does not. <laughs> they still have duplicate records all the time. Okay. For the communication function, we develop these things. So we call it the How Do I Library. And what this is, is a place for us to put materials for the grant recipients. So, for example, I have written instructions on how to do data entry. For the data entry, twice a month I do online trainings to train their grantees, um, grant recipients, grantees, how to put things into the database. And then they have written instructions as well. So again, this is a wide user base, so we want to give them multiple options. We also, um, so NIFA, our administrators, they do things like how to do the reporting and the reporting systems, and those webinars are also available here. So anything else we think that the grantees need, we add into this library for them. We also have a list of the users so they can get each other's contact information. I'm not going to open it because I promised them my hand on my heart that I would never show it to anyone who did not have a login. So you all have to get a login and then you can see. But then, and this is, this is the hard part. We developed forums, and let me start by saying that we developed these forums at the express request of the grantee. And I want you to look at the dates. You can see the tumbleweeds blowing through this website. So, you know, this is this has been a, a source of, of serious emotional upheaval for me. Uh, it's been very frustrating, uh, primarily because kind of the message you get through NIFA, the administrators, is that you know obviously you didn't build it right. But we go back over it, and everything they asked for, we did. They said they wanted a way to communicate online with each other, to share um, files. You can add files to your posts. They wanted uh, to get emails from these discussions when there's a new post done. Um, and that's all squishy. You know, everything we asked for was rebuilt. Um, so it's there. So why isn't it being used? And there's lots of reasons for this. Um, one has to do with kind of trying to think of the right word to use, um, <laughs> with, with kind of just the way the management of the system is. So you saw the, the federal law, and I said that's right nested in with the other law saying that they will also um, do this grant program for the recipients. So they're right next to each other, so there's an assumption there that they're going to work together. But there's nothing written down, not in, the, not in the federal law and not in that RFA that NIFA wrote, that says that anyone who received a grant is required to contribute to the database or to participate in the extra net. And so there's two schools of thinking. One is that if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. And the other is we're giving these people a lot of money, so they should just do it. And um, the first school of thought, of course, is the one that, that works, that, that goes. Um, so this gets into the big issue of, of data management and in these grants. How do we get the data there? We don't 
once we lose it, which is the fear and, the, and what actually happens if you don't have a good policy in place. The other reason these aren't being used is because of diversity. Again, it's a universal oneness idea. Everyone wants to show up in these forums. Why wouldn't they? Um, we have a diversity within the grant program. We have um, programs recipients who are coming from Ivy League schools. You know, they have six grant writers on staff. They have their own IT people. So they'll build their own internet when they feel, they feel like they want to use forums. And then you have people who really have little to no access to technology. And they need extra help. They need extra time. And we don't have the staff to give it to them. So yes, yeah, this, is, this is a big heartbreaker. But as my coworker said, I'm not very zen about it. It's like, we did it. We did what we could do. Um, and we keep going after them with carrots. Of course, we have no sticks. Um, so we keep, we keep trying to go after them with carrots. We have one carrot left, I think. <laughs> and that's our verification system. So let me cover that. Um, so what is the verification system? Go back to the grant. And remember, people promised to do certain things when they got the grant. Someone has to sit down and see if they did them. And the way this is done currently, and, and let me say real quick, um, there's a new reporting system within the USDA called Report. It came out like last week, and I haven't seen it yet. So I'm talking about a reporting system that has been in play up until about a week ago um, when I talk about the current reporting system. The current reporting system is, is called CRIS. And what it is, is I, I, if the rumors are true, it was developed before the internet. Um, it's these huge text boxes, and, and it's so funny because everyone's talking about the WikiLeaks issue. Basically that. Um, and people just dump massive amounts of text. Actually, I, I say that's, that's not true. Um, they go in and they put in text, but it has a cutoff limit. So if you did all this amazing stuff, you only get to report half of it. Um, so it has a lot of limitations and a lot of difficulties. But basically, people just go in and they put a paragraph or two about what they did. They do this every year. And we promise to assist with reporting, which apparently means that my coworker um, is going to do all of the reporting. And so what she's do done every year for this entire grant is sit down for months at a time and go through the Chris reports. First of all, to find what people promised to do, which is not clear. And then to find out if they did it each year. And she created her own database for that, um, trying to keep track of everyone and what they, what they did. And just painstakingly going through line after line. And the issue that she ran into with this, one, one of the issues, there's all kinds of issues over this, but um, is that some people would report, say they would say, this many people showed up to our courses. And then the next person would report and they say, this percentage of people finished our courses. So she'd go through all of this um, really dense text and come up with apples and oranges. And then she's supposed to mix them together and produce a report. So our attempt, and this is um, under development, to kind of fight this phenomenon is what we call verification system. Okay. okay. And there's actually two content types in here, but I'm only going to open up one. The first content type is for the goals um, themselves. So the people said, we'll do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this. And so we let them put them in. And under your grant, you said you do this. That's goal one. And then you said you did this. That's goal two. Um, so what they can do then is each year, they can open up a new, a new form for this record. They, re they say what year they're reporting for. And then they find their goal that they already made. And they say, I'm reporting for this goal. And then the title, you can see the question marks. You're trying to figure out what to do with that. Then they have their chance to put a whole bunch of text. So if they want to sit down and say this, they, they don't feel that they can explain it otherwise, they can say, this is what we did. But then, <laughs> she's been playing in this today, because when I was looking at this earlier, these were actually in a different order. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, but then, 
then you're able to go in and you can give specific numbers and she is kind of um, dictating exactly which number she wants. So she's going to say, okay, one of your goals was to bring in this demographic and, and train them. So here's your chance to say who your target audience is, who you meant to get in there, and who actually showed up. If you're doing promotional materials, if you're doing a newsletter, this lets you say, I sent out a newsletter, and I sent out 2,000 of them to 1,500 people. Um, so she is creating structured data. <laughs> That's another big theme here. That allows us to actually do the reporting. We're making better data. We're making richer data. Uh, we're making more effective data. The training materials, um, and then you're also able to say what kind of changes you've seen. So they're actually able to go say well, there was a knowledge change. You know, they took a pretest and a post-test, and they knew more on the post-test. So this verification system, like I said, is a carrot. Do I hold out hope that this is going to be an effective tool to get people to use the extranet? I don't. Um, what I believe um, is, is the case here with the extranet is that we needed to start this whole process, the, the start to farm, the clearinghouse function, the database, a year before any of the other grants even got their, their money. We should have been able to be up and built, and then when they received their grant, we should have been able to go in and say, and here's what you're going to do now that you have your grant. And I think that's the only effective way to do this. Um, if you're starting in the middle, if you're trying to gather all these people in from the four corners of the country, because we're not an international program, uh, it becomes very difficult. There, many of them are confused about what they're supposed to do. Many of the people we work with, this is their first grant they've ever done and have received. So they really need uh, hand-holding and extra time and extra attention, which they weren't able to get. So we're talking about data management. Um, and then let's talk about the, briefly about the future of Start the Farm. So we've got 1.5 years left on the grant. Um, so we're going to try and we have a list of stuff that we want to happen in that time. and then. The future is one of the reasons NAL got this particular grant is because they can keep the live site, the, the, the public facing site up. So it will continue to be at NAL, at the National Agricultural Library, even if the grant is refunded. What state it's in and how much work it can do on it, how dynamic it will be, is another issue, but it will continue to exist. We're also looking at other options um, on how to continue the program. Once we create, once we finish our, um, our search functionality that we want to build, but also the, the verification system that we want to build, we want to use this as a model. We kind of want to try and shop it around the USDA and say, you know what, there's a better way to get information. Um, people talk so much about the, the overwhelming amount of data and information that's out there, but I tell you what terrifies me is the amount of data that's missing um, that should be there or it's not in a usable format. Um, we lose a lot of information because we're not managing it very well. So I'm hoping that Start Your Farm will be a good example of, here's what you can do. You can get it in. The trick is you have to get it at the beginning and not at the end or in the middle. And then last, public information is public information. It's for the public. It should be presented to them in a way that is meaningful and useful and findable. Um, so all those assumptions that I talked about, we have to be aware of them and we have to start pulling things together, getting things in. So it's like join the librarians and let's get everything gathered in and organized and available. Um, so that is start to farm. Definitely a success on one end, um, a challenge on the other, although I think in the end it will be a very good thing. Um, and I thank you for your time and I invite anyone that has any questions. Please ask them at the uh, mic. Oh, and please evaluate this test. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for talking. Um, so I was curious, there's an executive order to make kind of government 
data machine readable earlier this month, like data.gov or something like that. Um, do you know, like, start to uh, farm specifically or um, kind of sites like yours, maybe you know, like some other sites, what the expectation is that their data, like, machine readable, what's, what's that mean for, say, start to farm or for other smaller sites? Is that on your radar or what's... Well, one of the issues with a lot of the directives that come out of the government is they can mean so many different things. And until there's real guidance, it's very hard to say. In my opinion, Start the Farm is machine readable. Um, you know, it's on a laptop, it's on the internet. Um, and we do our best, even within the, the records in the public site, and also like we saw on the verification site, is to make this into structured data. So ideally, it would be a little more structured and we could move it around. Um, that's what I would love to see happen government, unfortunately, and, and this is the issue, is this data management uh, problem, is that there's no one saying, this is how we're going to manage data. Um, it's just kind of like everyone for themselves. So it's not XML or some, nothing like that. There's no guidance yet. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Uh, first of all, great job on the uh, site and organizing the information, having dealt with uh, USDA organic certification and FFVP uh, programs. It's extremely difficult to uh, get the resources together um, to find it and organize it. So that's a big task. So the next question is, do you find other traction in USDA in programs like that, the FFVP or um, organic certification where there's a movement to kind of, uh, I guess, along that to streamline and um, use um, similar formats of uh, displaying data? Well, part of the issue, and I think this is every organization, is, is we tend to have silos. So I come to an event like this and I hear about other programs that are going on and doing it. Um, there is there's several people within the USDA that are working very hard to stop that from happening, to start talking to each other and saying, okay, what are you doing and what are you doing and what are you doing? Um, but my question is whether we should wait and let USDA do it, or a larger community do it, and let the USDA take it on after it's done. I vote for the latter. <laughs> sure. Well, I want to say congratulations on an awesome site. I work for a law library, and we don't have much of our own original content, but we catalog hundreds of URLs to legal resources out on the web, and we had to turn our practice results off the module was unstable and it made the website crash. So I was interested to know what are you all using to run your pretty little fancy search results on the left hand side? That is a squishy question. Do one of you want to come up and ask and answer that one? Hi, I'm Ben Hardy and uh, I work for Special Media and I'm one of the developers. Uh, and specifically to answer that question, uh, we're using a search API uh, as the framework for the search, and then uh, Search API itself has uh, extension modules for that called uh, Fastest Search. Uh, and then there's a couple other modules that are doing things like rewriting URLs to make them pretty good stuff. So. Hi, I also work for government, uh, on government websites, and I'm curious, how do you measure success for this site? That is a good question. Um, this is, I think, another thing that is just really universal. Um, how do we sit down and say, how, how did we, you know, how did we do? Um, it's, uh, it's hard for us with under, you're probably familiar with the Paperwork Reduction Act, and what that is is that controls all of the data gathering for the entire federal government. And it actually stops us from doing things like putting up a feedback form right away and things like that. So that's a little bit difficult. We are using Google Analytics, um, and we see we see spikes and plateaus in that. Um, and for me personally, I am able to travel around to different conferences and talk to people, um, and I do measure quite a bit of success from that. Do they know about me and or me? Start a farm. It's not just me. Sometimes it feels like it's just me. Um, but, you know, do they know about us, and are they using us, and, and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's, um, that's, 
that's, again, an, another data management issue is we need to know how do you tell when you're successful. Um, but we are using analytics, and we have people say, oh, I used your site, it was great, um, or I used your site, and I couldn't find anything. Um, and we just do the best we can do. Well, I'll be around, and you can actually contact me through Start the Farm, the contact information if you would like. And thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Have a great afternoon.